Okay, good afternoon. My name is Lonnie Love. I'm a research scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I'd like to welcome you to ORNL's Manufacturing Demonstration Facility. Uh, this facility is sponsored by the Department of Energy's Advanced Manufacturing Office, and our primary function is to help industry and help the additive manufacturing industry kind of expand and really have a bigger market penetration in terms of advanced manufacturing. And one perfect example is what you see behind me, uh, the, the BAM, the big area additive manufacturing. Most 3D printers make parts that are about one cubic foot in volume at a rate of about one cubic inch an hour with feedstock that costs anywhere from fifty to hundred dollars a pound. BAM is radically different. It grows things that are very large instead of one cubic foot in volume it can go up to about a thousand cubic feet in volume. Instead of one cubic inch an hour we're going well over 2,500 cubic inches an hour or 100, 100 pounds of material an hour. And instead of very expensive feedstocks, the material costs anywhere from a dollar a pound to five dollars a pound. So it really gets to industrialization of additive. Um, where it's being used is a broad spectrum of applications from automotive, aerospace, uh, even appliances and furniture. And, and that's what has us extremely excited is just the flexibility of the technology. We'll go over here and take a look at the cars. So a couple of perfect applications of where this large-scale printing makes perfect sense is in prototype vehicles. So we started by working with local motors. Last year we printed the very first 3D printed car with local motors up in Chicago at IMTS. After the local motors we started working on the, the Cobra. This is the printed Cobra for the Department of Energy. Now we've kind of evolved into the, the PUV. This is the printed utility vehicle. This is radically different than anything we've done before. First, it's much larger. Uh, also, instead of being a purely electric vehicle, it actually has uh, uh, natural gas tanks embedded in the frame, as well as a battery. Then it's got a generator in the back of the car. So it's really a hybrid electric vehicle. It'll take that natural gas, it uses that to run the, the generator, and then that provides the power, the electrical power we need for the drivetrain as well as charging the batteries. But it also goes one step further and, and is ena enabling us to really look at the, the synergistic uh, combination of housing, buildings, and transportation. If you look at energy in the United States, a lot of energy goes to those two main things, buildings and transportation. And what we're looking at is can we bring those two together? And this is what this, this system enables us to do. So we have in our car a generator. It can provide electrical power. We can use that power for transportation. But we can also go one step further. and It has two-way wireless transfer so that I can use the power in the car to actually wirelessly power the house. Or vice versa, I can use the power from the house and transfer that back to charge the car. But really looking at how do you combine transportation as well as buildings into one, one seamless piece. Uh, soon after that we now have the printed Jeep. This is a vehicle that we made for the military and it really gets into where that we think there's also a lot of opportunities. The military has a lot of legacy equipment, things that are 20, 30, 50 years old and they can't we can't re repair them any longer. They don't have replacement parts. They don't have the tooling to make replacement parts. So can we use the BAM to be able to grow parts that can go on to military vehicles if there's no replacement. And so the whole body on the Jeep uh, from the frame up has been printed. It took about seven to eight hours at a cost of probably around a couple of thousand dollars. So if you take, if you take off the grill, uh, things that are printed on the, the Jeep are the grill, the fenders, uh, the whole body, all of that has been replaced with these carbon fiber reinforced materials. And again, looking at how can we keep military vehicles moving. Another example of where it's going, even at a larger scale, so this is the LVAD. This is a vehicle that the Army has that uh, for, it's a general utility vehicle, it's very large. They actually put it on a pallet and drop it out of planes, parachuting it into forward lines. And when they do that, generally things will break. And so we're going to be using the same basic principles we, we used on the Jeep here where we can actually take things like the hood of the truck and 3D scan it and print out replacement parts. Doing that in hours to days rather than months or years. 
There's actually a lot of these pieces of equipment that are not functional today just simply because they can't get replacement parts. So this really does change the, the business model for how to keep legacy vehicles operational. So the same technology that's used to produce replacement parts for trucks, cars, uh, airplanes can also be used for the tooling used to make these parts. So these are some examples of like a mold that we printed for, the, for a suitcase where instead of having something made out of aluminum and machined down to the final part, you can print out a mold, finish it, and then make a final part like this carbon fiber reinforced uh, uh, this carbon fiber uh, suitcase. Another example is a hood of a car. So a mold typically like this will be made out of aluminum or steel. Uh, it'll cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars and take months and months, six months, nine months to have manufactured. By going with the large scale printing, we're able to do this instead of in months, do it in a couple of days. This takes about eight hours to print about four hours to machine and, a, and about a three to four hours to do the final finishing on it. And off of this you can pull things like a light, very lightweight carbon fiber hood. So really looking at the whole manufacturing uh, life cycle of how can you use this technology for making end use parts as well as tooling for mass production. And so far we've been talking about how the technology is used. Here we're going to show some of the basic elements. This is really injection molding without a mold, so all of the basic elements that you've seen so far actually come from the injection molding industry. The feedstock is pellets. These are just standard materials that you use in the injection molding industry. You'll notice that they're black. That's because there's a lot of carbon fiber in the material. Uh, you buy these by the ton, again, at a cost of anywhere from a couple of dollars a pound to five, ten dollars a pound. The material is then pulled into a large silo. This is a dryer. That dryer wicks off all of the moisture so that when it goes to the extruder, which melts those pellets, there isn't any moisture in there that evaporates and causes bubbles. So it's a real simple system for being able to grow big parts. So this is our experimental test bed for the BAM. And it allows you just to get up a little bit closer and see what's going on. But the basic elements are all the same between this machine and the Cincinnati machine. You have dryers in the back that get, the, that get all the moisture out of the pellets and then you'll see these feed lines that feed the pellets to the extruder that then has them come down and goes into a single screw that's like an auger. It melts that material as it rotates it squeezes it out. It melts it and gets like a, almost like a toothpaste type texture and then uh, the gantry moves around uh, growing apart layer by layer by layer. You'll also no notice the vibrating platen that's to actually pat that material down to get any air out of those seams between the parts. So again, you're growing the part layer by layer, bit by bit. This system can build parts that are about seven feet by seven feet by five feet at about 10 to 20 pounds an hour. The large scale system with Cincinnati, uh, it has a build volume of eight feet by 20 feet by six feet, and it's building parts between 70 and 100 pounds an hour. Now this is all scalable. We're looking at going much, much larger, looking at things that can make things that are about 35 feet wide, 35 feet tall, and in excess of 100 feet long. The application is marine boats, as well as wind turbine blades. How can you print a mold for a big wind turbine blade? And the rates that we're looking at are in excess of about 1,000 pounds an hour. So this is all scalable. Richard Feynman said, you know, there's plenty of room at the bottom. We believe for additive manufacturing, it's just the, just the opposite. There's plenty of room at the top. We can make very, very large structures.